Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Ah, Father in heaven, we thank you for a glorious day, Lord. We come to you this morning, and as we open up your word, we pray that you would open up uh, these words to make them real to us. Lord, help us to apply them to our life. Lord, we just don't want to be Christians today. Lord, we want to be believers and followers every day of the week. We pray now that you'd give Pastor Izzy strength, Lord. We know that his body is weak right now. as He's he's struggling uh, with, with some illness right now, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you would take it away. Lord, we sang this morning to humble ourselves, Lord. Lord, when we're sick, <laughs> we're weak, we're humble. Mm. And Lord, but you can lift us up. Lord, and the great trials uh, bring great celebration. So Lord, we pray this morning that you would use Pastor Izzy to speak to each one of us. Lord, let us lay all of our cares at your feet. You're the only one big enough to deal with them anyway. Mm-hmm. We ask that now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7? <clears throat> I'm fighting something that's tickling my, right in that middle between your lungs, that little bronchial thing is spazzing. So this might be the shortest message I ever gave. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to get um, at least the end of chapter 7 and the first couple verses of chapter 8 this morning. But this is one of the portions of Scripture that we're going to come to in chapter 8 when we get there that answers a question that was one of the biggest questions I ever had um, you know, about God and faith and how do you know if you can get into heaven type thing. Um, I, I went to know for sure. How do you know for sure? Any, anyone ever thought this? How would you know for sure you're going to go to heaven? If you ever had that question today, I get to show you the answer to that because Paul writes it to the church at Corinth. Now, Paul's writing, and in this chapter, chapter 7, he started the chapter saying, now concerning the things of which you wrote, about your questions, you know? And so you, when you read chapter 7, you can see that it's kind of like, if, if any of you ever listened to the, the call-in radio show that we do, the, the to Every Man and Answer um, on CSN, they call and ask Bible questions, and people have all sorts of questions, you know? So what had happened here at the Church of Corinth, they had sent word to Paul and said, we got some questions for you, Paul. It's all like, this is like direct 101 uh you know, to every man an answer. He's answering all the questions. But he's the guy who founded this church, you'll remember, on a second missionary journey. So they got questions for the founding pastor. What about if you're married? What about if, you know, um, h- how do we handle these certain situations? And so one of the situations we saw that Paul talked about that if you were married and you were with um, an unbelieving spouse and the, and the unbelieving spouse was willing to stay with you, what were you supposed to do? stay. I mean, you might be the one that is is there as a light to that person to help them come to salvation. Now, if they don't want to stay, Paul said the the believer is free, you know, and it's um, you know, there's no condemnation, they're free to go on. And uh he's, he, you know, there must have been a question. I'm sure that came up, you know, somebody was you know, married to an unbeliever and and the unbeliever didn't want to stay, or some of them were willing to stay. And Paul has to answer, what do you do? And I mean, it's, it's a legit question. Then he talks about the singles. What about if you're single? Are you allowed to marry? You know, should you remain single? Paul, you see that his attitude was, if you, if you can receive it, he said, and you remain single, you have more time just for your devotion to be to the Lord. And we got all the way to verse 35 where he said, for these things I say to you, I write them for your own benefit, not to put restraint upon you. He's not putting rules on them. If you're single, you can't get married. He says, but just to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. This is where we got to last week. He says, I'm just writing so that you won't be distracted in your devotion to God. How many things do we have to distract us from being devoted? I mean, seriously, in our culture, I think we are like, we have the distraction magnets galore. I mean, they're everywhere. There's always something to get our mind, you know, taken off the Lord when we're trying. Have any of you ever purposed in your heart, this week I'm going to seek the Lord more. I'm going to get up and read my Bible at least a couple minutes to start off my day. Has anyone ever tried this, by the way? Like, in your heart, you say, I'm going to do it. And what happens the next morning when you 
we're going to start off your week with, I'm, I'm doing this week, I'm going to start now. I'm, you know, it's like New Year's resolution. I'm going to do it this week. And as soon as you get up, the toilet is overflowing, you know, or the, something just broke, or the washing machine, right? I mean, it's like something, dis, a distraction comes. A helicopter flies over your head while you're preaching. Oh, oh it's a... Hello. Go away. <laughs> We're having church or else land and come to service. Only at our church do we have, you know, paragliders going overhead. At least we have this, uh, we have cameras now so we can actually, can you film that guy so we can show that there's a paraglider over flying overhead. It's okay. It's like, oh no. <clears throat> you have to be a really anointed teacher to stay on track when you do church on the beach because there is all sorts of distractions, you know, just like when you try to do your devotion. And Paul knew this. He said, guys, I, I know that stuff happens in life that distracts us. It happens all the time. So he says, I'm writing to you to secure undistracted devotion. I'm, I'm saying, hey, let's focus in and keep the focus. Now, this is a message that probably could be repeated to every church all the time, right? Are you seriously circling around again? You better hurry up and land. He likes the message. Stay focused, buddy. <clears throat> now he goes on. Today we're going to come to the, the, just a few, I, I can tell Paul is answering a few more questions that they had because he now touches on the, what about the um, young girls, the virgin daughters and, the, and their dads? The, the relationship between, um, remember in Middle Eastern culture, which by the way, we still somewhat honor this tradition of you had to ask for the daughter's hand in marriage. And oftentimes in their culture, you had to pay a dowry for the, for the girl. You had, to, you had to show that you were committed to take care of her. You had to cough up some, some things of value to give to the father as a gift to say, yes, I, I, I'm not only... You know, you're, you're like saying, I will take care of your daughter. Here's a present for you, sir. Can I, ha can I have? Not, not, it's not expected like I get her for sure. It's can I have her hand in marriage? Now, I actually did this with, with my father-in-law, asked for my wife's hand in marriage, and my son-in-law, Robbie, asked me. And I, I grew up old school, I guess, because this is something I understand. And but to some people who don't know that tradition, then they read this verse, they don't get it. Okay, so let, let me just preface it with that. This is a culture where you had to ask for the girl's hand in marriage. What if you're the dad and you got some schmuck asking? Oh, am I allowed to say that? Well, so, you know, some guy who you know, no way, I'm letting my daughter, I'm not going to doom her to that, to that character, you know. You, you, you know, dads, whether they folks want to believe it or not we do care about our daughters and we don't want them to be with some you know schmuck so we're like hey what what about and i bet you someone in corinth wrote to paul saying what if i don't want to give my daughter to that guy he might have even put the names you know this is from you know what elder so-and-so over there in corinth asking do i have to give my daughter to that guy you know he's a, he's terrible now, Paul doesn't mention any names. I'm just saying he could have been written like that. But, but concerning their questions, let's continue to read what his answer is. Verse 36, he says, But if any man thinks that he's acting unbecomingly towards his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth, past her youth means in their culture of she's past the childhood days, where, like now she's become able to bear a child. She's old enough to, to get pregnant we would say, she's past her youth. If she's old enough to bear children and she's a virgin child, and it, it says, and it, if it must be so, then let him do as he wishes. He does not sin. He <clears throat> Let her marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but he has authority over his own will, and he has decided in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, well, he will do well also. So he's saying to the dad, who has the right to make the call? The dad. I know this is flies against a lot of our culture in America, like this, a 
Who gives a rip if the dad cares or not? I'm marrying her. It's only between me and her. In their culture, that did not fly. Okay, it would not fly at all. That, that would be, the, you, you might as well just sentence yourself to death. If you go demand or take the girl without permission, that, that was going to bring wrath upon you. And if you grew up in my Sicilian upbringing, you know wrath in Sicilian upbringing is not good. You would not do this without asking. So, so I understand this, but Paul's saying, look, if the dad says okay, it's okay. But if the dad says no, guess what? It's still no. He's allowed to say, like, it's even, it's like Paul's answering the question, is a dad allowed to say no? Can you believe that pastors get asked questions like this when they call in on the radio show? Is a dad allowed to say no? When, the, What's the answer to this, by the way, scripturally? You have it right here now. You know where it is in the Bible. Verse 37, he is allowed to say no. To you young men, remember this when you're considering how you talk to your prospective future father-in-law. You some res- right? My son-in-law, before he was my son-in-law, was very respectful. Th- does that go a long way with us dads? Dads help out for the young men that are going to be crossing this hurdle someday. You want to show respect because he has the authority to say no. He's allowed to. He's like, nope, that's my virgin daughter. Not for you. Now, this was also a safeguard, by the way, for the gals. I know some people don't look at it that way, but it was. It was because there were some guys that should not have been, you know, they, they, go to the, they go to the Corinthian church. Oh, here's these beautiful young virgin girls. And they're like, oh, great. These, these Christian women, you know, virgins, great pickings. Let's go get one of them. And they didn't even, they didn't have to necessarily be a member of the church. They're just, have you ever seen what we call missionary dating or um, <clears throat> church attendance? Not for the sake of, they're not going to get close to God. They're going to get a spouse. This is spouse shopping, you know. Look, why shop at the bar? There's nicer kids. There's, there's, be, there's better produce at the church. Let's go there, you know. It's like, I, I mean, you might not think that way, but let me tell you. So there are some worldly folks that have figured this out. It, go to the church to get the good ones. And they do. There are fellows that go to church. I've even had a man come and tell me, I only come to this church because there's good, there's good godly women here, you know. And, and it's a lot better than what's out, you know, hanging out in the, in the community at the bars. So I just come here because I'm looking for the right wife. I'm like, great. You know, the rest of us are supposed to be here to look for God. And he says in Matthew 6, if you seek him first, his kingdom, his righteousness, then how many things get added? All things. You got your focus wrong. Now, if you're already here, we just need to redirect your focus heavenward. I mean, I got you in the seat, so let's just point your <laughs> eyes upward and let God do the matchmaking for you, okay? But this, is, this really comes down. I mean, this happens in churches. Now, look at the next question, uh, or, or the next verse, verse 33. He says, so then both he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well. He who does not give her in marriage will do better, he says. He's allowed to, he's even allowed to say no. And he says, now, the next one, this is a new paragraph, by the way, in Greek. So I know Paul's starting another answer. He says, a wife is but Try to figure out what question was asked here. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whomever she wishes, only in the Lord. In other words, she can remarry someone else in the Lord. What question did they ask? What if you're married and your spouse dies? In this case, particularly, what if a woman in the church, her, I can just see one of the guys going, could you ask Paul? <clears throat> There's a girl here, and her husband died, and I just want to know if I'm allowed to, right? They, they, they would call in on this one. They wouldn't use names. They'd just be, well, I know someone whose wife died, and I was wondering if someone else was allowed to go date her and marry her. Is that a, is, could, what's the Bible say? Believe me, they call in this question. And it's so good to have the book of Corinthians because Paul already answered it. If you're married, you are married until death do you what? Part. The covenant we take as husband and wife is for this life. I know this hurts some people's feelings because they, um, you know, were taught a romantic version of marriage. Like, 
We are soulmates for eternity. You may be, but you won't be husband and wife in the next life because in the next life, Jesus even was asked this question in the Gospels. They asked him, oh, there was a man, he, died, uh, he, he married and, um, and then he died and his brother, he, he didn't have any children yet. So according to the law, it says that the brother, the next old, older brother, had to fulfill the duty of his oldest brother and, and become her, her, take her as a wife and raise up offspring, you know, to carry on the name of his older brother. And so he takes his brother's widow and he dies. And then the next brother takes his, the, bro the two older brother's widow and he dies. By, and they go, all the, now this is something the Pharisees asked Jesus. How many brothers did, by the way, in the story? Do you guys know? Seven. <laughs> if I was number seven, I'd be like, I ain't eating your cooking, lady. <laughs> you know, like, no way, Jose. But, you know, I mean, this story is so cuckoo. But the Pharisees were, were trying to, it was actually the, the sect called the Sadducees that were asking this. And the reason, the, the, the sect of the Sadducees in Jesus' day where they were these religious snooty uppity ups that were like, we're the... We're, we're the, you know, really knowledgeable ones of the Word of God. We know all the stuff. But their philosophy was really, really blinded. I mean, they were so limited in their thing. They said, anything we can't see it, with our natural eye or we can't hear or perceive with our, our senses, then it doesn't exist. We have a name for these kind of people today, too. There's actually, you know, people today that believe... If it's like, like, uh, there's no such thing as ghost spirits. There's no spirit. In fact, when you die, you just go into nothingness. They believe that you died and that the life ended, period. You're done. You're dead. And so when they proposed this question to Jesus, the end of the story, they said, and so in the next life, since all seven brothers had her, whose wife will she be? Now, first of all, they're Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection anyway. So it's, a, it's like a loaded question they were trying to sting Jesus with. And Jesus tells them, he says, you guys got it wrong on both points. First on the point that there's a resurrection, there is. But the second point you got wrong is that when we're resurrected in our new heavenly bodies, there won't be marriage or given in marriage. You won't be married to the one you were married to here on earth. Instead, we read about this glorious marriage. A marriage what is, we are all invited to is called the marriage supper of what? Of the Lamb. And who's getting married? Christ marries who? The church, collectively. He, we become what's called the bride of Christ. So Jesus says, you got it all wrong. As far as when we, you know, go into the next life. So our vows actually reflect this. When we do the marriage vows, we say, do you take this person until death do you what? Part. So you vow to be their spouse in this life till death parts you. As soon as your vow is completed, when one spouse dies, you, you fulfilled your vow. Paul's just pointing out that if, if the woman's wife here has died, then she's free. She's free to remarry. Only, he says, in the Lord. Make sure you don't... That doesn't mean she can go remarry some schmuck that's not serving the the Lord, he said, get, a, get a good guy. But the answer is, truly, can she remarry? And now, if you don't mind highlighting this, it might not apply for you, but trust me, down the road of life, somebody's going to ask you this. Well, what, do, what does the Bible say about if you are married and one person dies? Or is the other person allowed to remarry? And what's the answer? Yes, what's the condition? In the Lord. You got the answer for them. They won't even have to call the radio show. You can just do it right there. <laughs> Save me the trouble, please. Just, I mean, I don't mind because I already learned the answers. They're right here. I also learned the attitude of Paul. Listen to this, verse 40. But in my opinion, Paul says, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think I have the spirit of God also. So his opinion, not he's not saying the Lord's thus say it, the Lord, but my opinion is if she stays unmarried, she'll be a widow that can serve God with undistracted devotion. 
and she can she can just have her whole life devoted to the Lord and she won't have to but but is it a sin if she remarries? No. And God might know there might be another man out there that needs her to be his helpmate now. It's not a bad thing. But just so you know where the answer is, it's here at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.